a good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Efeni Hera, and I am a program coordinator of our policy study organizations. So today we have our speakers, uh, Mr. Benjamin, and then the, sir, so I would love you to take over the panel and then they'll introduce a little bit about yourself and then the topic and then please take over the presentation. No, thank you very much. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. Greetings from Boston. I'm here to talk about something called geoengineering. I'm a professor of energy policy as well as earth and environment. So I'm very fascinated with these types of options. And I'm going to talk to you today about uh, why we may need them, how they work, uh, as well as key issues of controversy and kind of social acceptance. And so um, I always like to start with this question of like, what is this word geoengineering and why do you think we may need it? Uh, this narrative is becoming even more powerful year by year as we kind of fail to make meaningful progress in climate change. Both of these graphs show, despite knowing of the problem for 50 years, 100 years, and despite having this wonderful process in the UN, which is meeting right now in the UAE COP28, well, we still see emissions rise and we still see temperatures increase. If you look at the most recent Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. They're also telling us that as of now, the best scientific evidence we have says we have a 50% chance of exceeding four degree temperature change by end of the century. Four degrees centigrade would be devastating given that just a two degree change has these impacts according to nature. Six billion people at risk of heat wave exposure, three and a half billion people at risk of water stress, and hundreds of millions of people at risk to kind of habitat degradation, blackouts, and so forth. This would be a catastrophe for humanity. To say nothing of some of these other impacts, like the complete loss of coral reefs, the extinction of one million species by the end of our century, or on the right, uh, impacts from climate change that could exceed a hundred trillion dollars of damages a year if you account for sea level rise and storm surge by the end of the century. So our ecosystems, our species, and our economy is facing grave and sobering threats that we aren't doing enough to address. And that's where this notion of geoengineering comes in. Can we design technical fixes or climate interventions that either lower emissions, so this is negative emissions, where we not only reach emissions parity, but start to be net negative at storing carbon, or can we strategically deploy solar radiation management to lower temperature extremes over coral reefs, at the poles, over particular cities to help fight climate change? And what's interesting is these things sound like science fiction, but there are a number of interventions that are already being pursued of today around the world, whether it is direct air capture, these are miraculous devices that actually capture CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it. This is the carbon engineering pilot facility in Canada, which we visited. This is Climeworks facility in Iceland called Orca, uh, which is the biggest in the world. It stores about 4,000 tons of carbon dioxide per year. Or you could perhaps, uh, and this actually just shows you how that facility is even lower carbon because the Orca plant is coupled to geothermal. So there's no fossil fuels involved and it's the first kind of fully operational net negative DAC facility. Or we can use bioenergy and BECs to help store emissions. Or we could even do things like grow algae, macroalgae and seaweed, uh, which are apparently the fastest growing organisms on earth, like running tide is now doing off of the North Atlantic, where they're growing huge kelp beds that then sink and store carbon in the ocean and tracking those emissions reductions via satellites. I've also even had the privilege of going around the world to Australia, where they're using fogging, shading, and cloud brightening techniques over the Great Barrier Reef to help minimize heat stress. And then finally, there's even notions of going to outer space. <laughs> there's even a long history of interventions which we've cataloged going back 60, 70 years about putting reflectors or mirrors or shades into space at the Lagrange point between the Earth and the Sun, which you can then use to control reductions in temperature. People have proposed an interplanetary sun shield, and you can see here it would create a whole space economy 
where we could mine asteroids, launch missions to Alpha Centauri, and also use advanced AI and robotics. So our project, Genie, explores all of these, right? We have this whole arsenal of negative emissions and carbon removal techniques on the left, and these wacky kind of high-tech solar radiation management options on the right. And you can see that these can be deployed in a variety of ways, whether you kind of use the kind of centralized, top-down, hard approaches, uh, mono plantations, huge, potentially direct air capture facilities, or you instead do them bottom up grassroots democratically with communities and gardens uh, and distributed systems that are owned by communities rather than companies. You also see that they have whole varying degrees of technological readiness, which makes this an innovation challenge. Some have very low levels of technological readiness. They're just in the lab. They're just being simulated. Whereas others, uh, like painting rooftops white or using saline formations to store carbon are already being deployed commercially. So you have a whole gamut of different innovations. Given these technology options and their diversity, we also see some pretty interesting debates and controversies. And so one of the things we've done in our project is we interviewed 125 experts around the world, uh, places like Penn, and Harvard and MIT, uh, as well as trying to get perspectives from civil society, governmental organizations, and, and kind of private sector associations. And we asked these people, what are the reasons to do these interventions and what are the reasons not to? We came up with 107 reasons, right? More positive than negative for negative emissions and carbon removal, more negative than positive for solar geoengineering, and this helps break down all of those perceived benefits by those interviews. So you can kind of get a sense for like, if you're talking about the benefits of carbon dioxide removal, this shows you where the experts think we've got consensus, that are protecting life above land, creating new biosystems, helping provide jobs, or where you have experts who aren't really sure if it will contribute to tourism or help benefit particular industries. You also see the same with different risks. Our experts are telling us that carbon removal options have huge risks of water scarcity and could create a moral hazard of people choose not to mitigate emissions because they think we've got these technical fixes. Same with solar radiation management. Pretty large consensus on benefits to the aerospace industries and reducing poverty, but also risks like lack of social acceptance and these things being perhaps used to help modify weather, which is a very bad sort of thing as you can upgrade weather modifications. We pushed some of our experts to be even more precise, not qualitatively, but quantitatively. Uh, and we asked them questions like, do you think negative emissions technologies are necessary to achieve a stable climate? 90% said yes. Do you think solar radiation management is absolutely essential? Um, Two thirds of experts said no. We also asked our experts to, to ask, identify the risks. And you can see here in this nice spider diagram, there's kind of expert consensus that aerosol injection and ocean fertilization and high altitude sunshades and space-based reflectors are very risky, whereas others like ecosystem restoration and afforestation and soils and biochar are less risky. And some like enhanced weathering or DAC are kind of in the middle as moderately risky. We also then ask them to talk about different barriers, and this is a nice little traffic diagram. The more you see red, our options they think have the greatest number of barriers. The more you see green are fewer barriers. So it's kind of a nice system of kind of taking the temperature check for people's tolerance for these options. And finally, this is very interesting because we asked, when do you think the technologies can be deployed? This is showing you box and whisper plots that show the 27th and 75th percentiles. The line is the mean. And what I find fascinating about this is only the two options I've circled in red, ecosystem restoration and afforestation, do our experts think are deployable in the next decade. All of the other ones are mid-century. Direct air capture is 2050. And some of the other options like sunshades or aerosols are even pushed into the second part of the century. And of course, this is just presenting the statistical numbers. It doesn't underscore how many of our experts said never. We don't think any of these options 
will ever be deployed. 84% for space-based reflectors, 82% for sun shades, 80% for ocean alkalinization, and so forth. So it also gives you a sense for kind of expert skepticism about how much we can really rely on these different options. Maybe one of the reasons a lot of these experts are so pessimistic is that we've used this term risk, risk trade-offs. My students see this and think there's a typo. Why is it risk, risk? Well, it means a risk, risk trade-off is anytime you eliminate one risk by unleashing another risk. A really good example is from medical treatment. You have cancer, which is a risk, but then chemotherapy also has its own risks. And we see similar risk, risk trade-offs across all 20 of these different dimensions. The more affordable you make them for people and consumers, the less viability they are for businesses to invest and perfect. The more you use land for BEX, the less land you have for DAC. The more effective interventions are, the scarier they are to the public and can germinate in different social backlashes. And also, risks next. Some of these risks cascade, i.e. the risk of social backlash. If people view these options as threatening, then it's very unlikely you'll be able to test. It's very unlikely you'll get permitting for land. It's very unlikely you'll be able to kind of deploy rapidly because there's a social bottom. So everywhere you see red is a nested risk hierarchy where a particular dimension of risk shapes and affects other dimensions of risk. And we've seen this to be the case in our Australia trip where we looked at these different interventions. We looked at regenerating coral reefs, fogging and brightening, reforestation and afforestation and what's called enhanced weathering. And you can see for every single benefit, building resilience, jobs, tourism, water quality, there's also a risk, right? So there's no such thing as risk-free climate interventions. Not only do these risks exist at the individual or technology level, they also exist at a systems level where each portfolio of options creates risks that may hurt other dimensions. For instance, fogging and cloud brightening on the sea could actually impact forests on land. Enhanced weathering similarly could use pesticides or different fertilizers that also put restrictions on reforestation or release toxins that happen to go in to the Great Barrier Reef. So again, risk-risk trade-offs exist at the technological level and the systems level. Another lens that we've used is whole systems justice impacts to say, Justice issues are only where we deploy. It's not just this gray box where we operationalize and use climate interventions. We have a whole hidden supply chain of mineral extraction, resources, manufacturing, transportation, and even disposal and waste. And I, whenever I present this slide, people are often like, transportation and construction, how is that even a risk? And I just wanted to kind of tease this part out from our interview data. But we have people talking about how if we're going to actually minimize emissions and store them at scale, we will need super continental scale plantations the size of India. That's a huge risk of how we construct these types of nature-based solutions. Or what if we deploy them on tribal lands? There's no trust, right? So we may see huge elements of backlash and social opposition. Or what about fossil fuels? Many of the investment patterns may only benefit incumbents. So they're gonna squeeze out new entrants and new patterns of innovation, and it's all gonna to go to ExxonMobil and BP and Saudi Arabia. What's telling is that these types of justice dimensions don't just occur for the kind of engineered options like DAC and BEX. They also even occur for some of the nature-based options like forests and soils. And they cut across very, different dimensions of justice. It isn't just distributive justice. We also see them interfering with recognitional justice and vulnerable groups, procedural and participatory justice, things like uh, social acceptance and planning, and even notions of responsibility, capabilities, and functions. Finally, in terms of controversies, there is a debate in the literature and among our experts about weapons and security. Some of these interventions can actually be highly weaponized to control the weather. You have the risk of what's called a green finger. This is like a gold finger from James Bond, but someone who decides to deploy aerosols or other techniques. There's the risk of creating cartels like OPEC. There could be a green OPEC that forms around bioenergy. 
And there could also be situations of where we target geoengineering systems and military campaigns, or they even cause conflict, whether India deploys against Pakistan, North Korea deploys against South Korea, or there's even just miscalculation, misattribution, and a kind of arms race of counter geoengineering investments. And finally, I realize I'm almost out of time. Uh, we are trying to explore elements of social acceptance and public attitudes uh, using actual data from the public. And so here's a study that we published where we looked at Twitter. Uh, we looked at Twitter, now X, campaigns in the United Kingdom, Sweden, the United States, and India, and found highly toxic public discourses. These are discourses that are profane, offensive, vulgar or that promote conspiracy theories and i won't read the ones that i've highlighted in red but you can see a lot of profane language there which really implies that the kind of public discourse is being contaminated by toxicity we've also uh, actually this month in december published this piece in global environmental change where we looked at more than 1 million social media posts uh, and found again huge emotional reactions to how these technologies work. We looked at emotions around both carbon removal and geoengineering. And you can see here, the number of positive sentiments is almost outweighed by the number of negative ones. You can also see everywhere in red emotions of anger, disgust, which is purple, or fear. So the emotional balance of the discussion is highly tilted towards negative emotions. And finally, on the right of the graph, we estimate that somewhere close to 20 and 30 percent, so one in three of these social media posts are actually advocating conspiracy theories, fake news, and uh, scientific misinformation. So again, it's a kind of public discourse that is rife with disgust, negative emotions, and real connections to misinformation campaigns. Let me lastly say that the Genie Project has a knowledge portal where we've posted all of our research. You can also see our coverage in some recent places like Time and the Washington Post and Nature and The Economist, and that I am always available to talk about Genie and to help share work if you want to learn more by contacting me here. Uh, and I'm very open to hearing questions and comments. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva Coles. And uh, anybody have a question? Do you have a question? Okay, I'm going to go to this. Uh, this is Frederica Dorima, and thank you for this uh, kind of end-to-end -end presentation on um, bio on geoengineering. Uh, I kind of uh, when you first said that you know we are thinking of putting mirrors in space and you know for uh, controlling the radiation to come uh, arriving on Earth, I thought that you know it was far fetched. Uh, and I'm glad that uh, that was the assessment uh, in your surveys, uh, because if my question is, uh, you know, what uh, um, what altitudes these uh, mirrors will be, and also uh, there are issues with uh, space debris um, and um, you know affecting satellite operations. I mean, uh, you know, are you your study in that uh, has addressed these kind of issues? Great question. Um, some of these solar radiation management techniques can be very low tech. You can even do things on your roof, right? Sidewalks, roofs, and buildings. So you don't have to go to space, but you're right. The interventions kind of have different degrees of altitude. National Academies of Science in the US did a very nice report that took three options, marine cloud brightening, cirrus cloud thinning, and stratospheric aerosol injection. Those are at three different levels. Like marine cloud brightening is the closest to us. Uh, serious cloud thinning is up a bit higher, and then SAI is all the way at the top. And then, as you said, outer space is above the atmosphere, so it does have risks of space debris. Um, National Academy's report is two years old, but did a really good job summarizing what we know and what we don't know about those three options. I think the space-based one is interesting, but it's probably more speculative. We've built nothing. We have a few prototypes that people are kind of experimenting with, and you can check out the Interplanetary Sun Shield, put it into Google, it'll come up to their webpage, there's a foundation. They're looking at feasibility studies, but they're far less advanced than the other three, which are actually being experimented. Cloud brightening, cloud thinning, and aerosol injection. Okay, and you have another question? 
Uh, so as a farmer, um, I'm very interested in the uh, impacts on farmers and through uh, rippling through our food supply and the cost of food uh, for a more um, climate friendly farming practices um, because I'm, I'm not in favor of expensive food, <laughs> but I, I'm not in favor of farmers being priced out either. But if you could give a perspective on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, two, two thoughts coming from a lot of our data. The one is that that slide I showed about hard versus soft paths, you could almost read as paths good for farmers, paths bad for farmers. So like the good path is like farmers own a lot of the tech, they're experimenting with it, it's done at smaller scales, and it's done using a lot of nature-based things like soils and biochar and whatnot, versus a Monsanto approach where it's some huge company that buys all the land, uses you know, mechanization tech and robots and drones, and the farmers get no livelihood or jobs or local benefits. So I think that it could go either way. Right. And you see similar discussions right now, even with renewable energy, you can do it a centralized way, these huge utility scale power plants with solar panels in the desert or bottom up on buildings and schools and hospitals and communities. The other way is in our expert elicitation exercise, a few of the options seem to be really good and have strong positive couplings with farming. I'm thinking here of soil management and enhanced weathering. Both of those can actually enhance crop yields. And both of those can still be pretty low tech, like enhanced weathering could be sprinkling basalt on a field. So not that sophisticated. Um, so the positive couplings there and biochar uh, as well could actually be quite good for farming communities. We even interviewed one of our experts who lived in a house made of biochar. So that gives you a sense for the versatility of these types of materials, how they could revolutionize farming and small scale farming. But I think which way it goes is contingent, and it depends on the investments we'll be making in the next decade. Okay, any more question? One last question? No? Okay. If it's not, then I want to express my sincere appreciations for your insightful presentation on the socio-technical dynamic of negative uh, emissions, carbon removals, and the social the geoengineering. And then your in-depth explorations of this complex topic provide a valuable insight into the challenge and the possibility of climate solutions. So thank you for sharing your expertise and uh, contributing to a deeper understanding of the socio-technical uh, dynamic, you know, uh, surrounding climate solutions. And uh, yeah, so that is it. So thank you so much. And we will end the meeting right now. Have a great day.